So welcome everyone. Um, there was a few announcements I was going to make first, rather than at the end, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> oh, I've, I have raised the requested donation from ten to fifteen dollars. Uh, the reason why I'm saying it now is if that's not okay with well, you, can leave. Uh, and as always, uh, don't ever let your present financial condition stop you from coming to class. Uh, just talk to me about it. Uh, nothing is fine, uh, too. So expenses keep going up. Got to pay the rent and all that stuff. Um, and I have set the um, the retreat. Uh, the registration is up on the website today. The dates are May 11th to the 14th. Uh, I'll announce it in the in the email on Saturday. I'll probably send out a uh, just one for just that on Sunday. Uh, but now you know, so uh, register early, uh, especially if you want a, a quad room. There's only four beds uh, available in the quad room, which is the least expensive bed. And uh, there's only two more single rooms left for the men and the women, four rooms all, all together, two for the men, two for the women. Um, so um, we'll meditate first, uh, and then we'll discuss uh, last week's study on the concentration factors of the Eightfold Path. And I will introduce uh, Anicca, Anatta, and Dukkha tonight for this week's study. So uh, find your relaxed meditative posture. Gently close your eyes and gently close your mouth. And holding your back straight, but not stiff, your ears aligned with your shoulders, nose aligned with your navel. But holding yourself very loosely very gently, very lovingly. Allow yourselves to settle into this room, settle onto your seats, settle into your bodies, and settle into your minds. And take a moment to become aware of the sensation of breathing in your body. Just get a feel for what that's like, to be mindful of your breath in your body And while remaining mindful of your breath in your body, notice that thoughts are flowing. We're conscious beings, thoughts should be flowing. The purpose of meditation is to not be distracted by your own thoughts. So when you find that you're caught up in your thinking again, simply acknowledge that and return your mindfulness to the sensation of breathing. I'll repeat that. When you find that you're caught up in your thinking again, simply acknowledge that and return your mindfulness to the sensation of breathing. Relaxing your thoughts, remaining mindful of your breathing. And we'll meditate for 20 minutes with callbacks every five minutes.
relaxing your thoughts, remaining mindful of your breathing. Relaxing your thoughts, remaining mindful of your breathing. <clears throat>
relaxing your thoughts, remaining mindful of your breathing. If a persistent thought or feeling arises, stay with it for a moment or two, recognize it as impermanent, and return your mindfulness to the sensation of breathing. And we'll meditate for five more minutes.
Take a moment to notice the quality of your mind. Be at peace with your mind. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. There's no, nothing coming through the ceiling. It sounds like there's a roof leak, like right above you, Melanie. It could be my cracking ankles. Is yeah, but no, it's not. I know the difference because I know my own creaky ankles and just about every other joint I have. Um, so uh, tonight the discussion is on last week's homework on uh, the concentration factors of the Eightfold Path of right effort, right mindfulness and right meditation. So I'd like to hear uh, what you learned. Uh, and if you understand that right effort uh, primarily is there to guide us, to remind us that we have to put a little bit of effort into this path, uh, that right mindfulness shows what we should hold in mind. Uh, in other words, uh, we can hold in mind anything that we choose to, uh, especially anything that we're conditioned towards holding in mind, or we can hold in mind what the Buddha taught the four foundations of mindfulness and to be mindful of each factor of the Eightfold Path. And then how right meditation is primarily for deepening concentration so that we can accomplish that task of maintaining refined mindfulness of the Eightfold Path. So we'll start with Melanie. Good to see you tonight, Melanie. We, I don't remember if you were here last week. I was I'm sorry. So are you, have you been keeping up with us? Yes. Okay, then you can answer. <laughs> it's um, good to see you. Just a kind of a general comment, maybe, um, or an observation. I, um, in light of the, I guess, right effort, and then perhaps right meditation, um, da daily life, I've noticed that um, the more I feel, or my own presence is unfolding more, and I'm being more present in my body, I, I've been noticing other people's like what presence is coming out of them. Yeah. And I don't know how to explain that. Um, that's pretty good though. I mean, that's an aspect of being more mindfully present in your body. And so you're more mindfully present for what other people are displaying to you. Uh, the Buddha was often seen as um, somebody who could read people's minds or was clairvoyant because he could spend just a moment with someone, look in their eyes and he would instantly know the right thing to say to them. Uh, and that's, it, that's remarkably present throughout the Pali Canon. But we gain that ability simply because we're more mindfully here. So since we're more mindfully here for us, we're more mindfully here for other people. Uh, and it, it, that can be a pretty profound experience at times. When you realize how much of other people's lives you haven't been able to even be a part of because of your own distractions. That brings great meaning to your life, doesn't it? Yeah, really, that's that's exactly it. It's that I'm appreciating the fact that, wow, you know, the more I do this, I mean, I don't know if you say, oh, it's exciting or something. It's, it's um, I don't know, it's like, wow, there, there's a whole world out there that maybe I haven't been able to appreciate. Yeah, I think it is exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a very skillful way. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Is that really, that's... Um, that's a profound example of deepening mindfulness. So, and it's important to recognize that too. So thank you. Stefan, good to see you tonight. How's your study going? Uh, it's going okay. Um, I, th I think I understand the parts of the path that were in this week's chapter enough um, to apply them for now. I, I guess I've been thinking a little bit about um, the challenges of keeping up on meditation practice when one is traveling or when one's routine is disrupted for whatever reason. Um, sometimes it seems like it doesn't take much <laughs> in terms of, you know, some change in the schedule to make it so that I'm not sitting twice a day. So I'm thinking about that and we're going on another trip tomorrow. So I'll be, I'm trying to find a way to 
we'll make sure there is some sitting even while we're away from home for most of the next week. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great opportunity to practice right effort, isn't it? And I hear that so often, Stefan. So many times people say, well, I was away for a week or even a couple of days and I just didn't meditate. Um, and it's just it's just a common aspect of conditioned thinking. Any change in, a, in our routine um, is a potential for distraction. And once we're out of our environment, we are distracted. And it's hard to even remember that I want to meditate. But the more we do it, the more we integrate that practice into our life, no matter what's occurring, the more we remember it. But it's just a, it's just a part of, of developing the Dhamma. You know, you're, not, you're not unique in it. Um, and that you're mindfully aware of it gives you the opportunity to change it tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. It's another one of those times where you, at least I am more, um, more aware of the value of having a sangha, you know, during these experiences, having a group of people to sit with. Oh yeah. It really helps support actually sitting. Yeah, it, it does. It, it's really, I can say it's surprising. Maybe if that's not the right word, but uh, I'll use it. Um, you would think that all we would need was just to say, well, I'm going to meditate and I'm going to be a meditator. I'm going to do it every day, twice a day for 20 minutes. Or, but it usually doesn't work out that way. We do need a lot of support. And that's one of the reasons why the Buddha didn't teach just meditation. He didn't just teach a solitary practice. He taught over and over again the importance of a well-focused Sangha. You know, I keep saying how fortunate we are to have this well-focused Sangha here. So. And thank you for bringing it up. It, it's a very common occurrence. Anything that kind of change, even um, a change in our physical condition can have us miss our, you know, fall off our practice and feel a little lousy. Melanie, had and just something that helped me, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to bring that up. Sure. Okay. Um, when I'm away from, because for me it's the same thing, like Sangha, it's so much I don't know, easier yeah. to focus in on everything, and then when you go away, the same thing happens for me. And um, someone had mentioned, and since you use technology, you can appreciate this, uh, <laughs> an app, and then I didn't really like the app that they had mentioned that helped remind me throughout the day. And I found one by accident called Mindfulness Daily. I don't uh -huh. know this is. But um, so every once in a while, my phone does this calm thing. And then if I want to, I can press a button and then it'll give me a pause, breathing in, breathing out with all these different calming pictures. But it sounds maybe silly, but at the same time, several times a day, it focuses me in. And it's, all, right. it's like, so it's doing it for me when I'm out of my practice say if I'm away somewhere, it kind of helps me to refocus. That's great. Thank you. What they call Mindfulness Daily. Mindfulness Daily. And it's an app. Yeah. Great. It's... Thank you. Yeah. That's what the song is for. <laughs> Mindfulness Daily. Good. Thank you. Melody. Ron, good to see you tonight. How are you? How's your practice? Uh, <clears throat> practice is, is good. Um, I realized not too long ago that whenever I try to kind of recite the eightfold path. I can only come up with a sevenfold path. <laughs> Which one is it? Consistently <laughs> one that you right effort. <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk about conditioned thinking. Yeah. I, you know, not that I feel like I'm, I'm missing uh, the right effort in my, in my practice, but I just cannot ever come up with, with that part of the path. <laughs> um, but you're engaging in it otherwise. Well, I'm not engaging in it anyhow. So that's fine. But I, I was just reading the the, uh, the book you know, before I came in here, and I realized I I need to focus a little bit more on on how right effort and right mindfulness and right concentration work together. I mean, yeah. Right concentration that that's going on pretty well. Right mindfulness also, but I'm kind of missing the tie in with right effort. So uh, I'm just going to have to focus on that a little bit more. Yeah, and that, that's the right way to see it. Right effort is simply the effort that is necessary to develop a meditation practice and to develop the broader framework of the Eightfold Path. And also part of right effort is being part of a well-focused Sangha. Mm -hmm. It's funny, when I first came across the Eightfold Path, it took me, I don't know how, many, how long it took me just to memorize what they were. Mm -hmm. And the one that I kept such a hard time memorizing, even though I was meditating, was the last one, was right meditation. <laughs> But at the time, I was bouncing back and forth between different meditation techniques. You know, when I finally settled on what the Buddha taught, then I remembered right meditation. So it probably has to do with what we're practicing, too. So thank you for bringing it up. Mary Beth, good to see you. How's your practice been going? It's so good to have you back with us tonight. Thank you. Um, I missed being here. 
And I'm just getting back into my practice the last couple of weeks, so it had pretty much just completely dropped off. And um, <clears throat> I, I hate when that happens because uh, when I get back to it, I just see like the being too busy or whatever it is that keeps me from it is just, it's like ridiculous because yeah. everything goes better <laughs> when I just sit for I started out with just 10 minutes and I do I was at night, um, occasionally in the morning, but, um, and now I'm back to 10 minutes, so it feels good. Yeah, good for you. And also I've been just really struggling with coming here. Um, it just, it's just hard to get away, you know, all, whatever reasons. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to start with once a month instead of trying to get here every week. Yeah. <laughs> so that feels, that feels manageable to me. Yeah. Good for you. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll be more than that, but. Yeah, I hope so, but it, it's nice to see you tonight. Yeah. And I, as you can see, I'm recording these now. So there's mm -hmm. a, a bunch of yeah, recordings no. that you can. I just think, wow, I can come yeah. But you still need to come here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad well, you're here. Well, it's not the same, I know. Yeah. But it's there for you. I'm glad you're here tonight. Mark, good to see you. How are you? How's your practice? I'm well. Practice is good. Um, for me, I'm just finding myself trying to focus in on right mindfulness. I'm recognizing agitation coming up. Um, not really sure why, <laughs> but just trying to be aware of it um, and then kind of return myself to, to my breath, um, just you know, on and off the cushion. So, so I guess a, what I would consider a little bit of a rough patch. Not really sure why, and I'll just get through it. So. Yeah. It might be just a an example of the first noble truth and might have very little to do with what's going on with you. Yeah. Uh, an agitated mind, it's it's good that you're not going to, to that to try and analyze it. Right. Because an agitated mind is uh, the result of a lack of concentration which means you don't have the ability to maintain that refined mindfulness, but that's not why you're doing this wrong. Yeah. It's why we need the Dhamma. I, I think that realization came to me some time ago and I've been so thankful for it to not try to analyze it because in the past I had always been very analytical. Well, why am I feeling this way? If I can figure it out, I can get to root cause and then I can solve the problem. And all I did was just get more agitated. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so the root cause is what the Buddha awakened to. The root cause of all stress and suffering is ignorance of Four Noble Truths. And once we fully understand and fully develop the Four Noble Truths, there's no, there's no cause to agitation and distraction. There's nothing there. That, that's, in fact, that's part of what our next retreat's going to be. And I'll probably do a, at least a, a, a one-day thing on that. That's the meaning of emptiness. That's what the Buddha meant as emptiness, not as some kind of mystical environment, but to be empty of the of the causes of our own distraction and stress and suffering. And how do we do that? By through right intention in the rest of the eightfold path, abandoning, craving, and clinging. And so, going to analyze something is an aspect of craving. I want to know what's wrong here. And you can never get there. But if you remember, it's ignorance of Four Noble Truths, that points your mind in the right direction immediately. And you usually stop beating yourself up. Not that you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell Danielle I said hello. Hi. Peter, good to see you tonight. How is your practice? My practice is just beginning. Let's see if it's my first time here. Yeah, welcome back. First time doing this type of meditation. And, uh, so, and I've read the introduction to the book, the first chapter, listening to the recording of the first week. Good. And uh, sitting and, and being aware of my breathing, being aware of my thoughts. Uh, the most significant thing to me right now is my thoughts seem to come from physically different locations. Some are low, some are high, Good. some are coming over the shoulder, some Good. seem to come from out of nowhere. Some I respond to, some I don't respond to. I'm not sure if that has any significance at all, but that's that's what I've been thinking about. No, there, there's the significance is it, in it is to recognize that when thoughts arise, we come back to the sensation of breathing. In other words, it doesn't matter where they come from or even the seeming importance of them. In meditation, whatever comes up, a feeling, a thought, come back to the sensation of breathing, and then you're using meditation the way it's meant to be 
use in this framework to deepen concentration. Again, often we're looking for either an escape, meaning a place where we don't have any thoughts, which really is impossible, or we're looking to have some type of experience, which again is really just another form of eye making up. I want to have something done rather than to deepen concentration. And you're, uh, when you get to the third week in the book, and you might want to review it on, online too, uh, that's on the four foundations of mindfulness. And in that teaching, uh, we learn that as feelings arise, we come back to the sensation of breathing without reaction. This is in meditation. As thoughts arise, come back to the sensation of breathing. And we're not allowing what would normally be a distraction and cause a reaction in our minds to do the same thing. We're, we're training ourselves to be well concentrated on our cushion. Uh, and I can tell by your question that you're getting it. So I'm glad you're here. Okay. Nobody behind Mary Beth. Diane, good to see you. How are you? Yes. <laughs> good to be here. Thank you again and again for okay. doing this so steadfastly. Um, I, I, realized that I often um, one of the things that my a pattern of my mind is it will replace a delusion with another delusion mm -hmm. and another delusion and and meditation I mean it gets kind of wild in there about med if I meditate it's it's like ego plays this game with me if I meditate then this will happen <laughs> and I think no I can't think that way so then then you know it just it goes on and on and on and i want a uh, surgery to remove my ego so that it just quits <laughs> but, but <laughs> i have a side bit of the business where i do that <laughs> saturday <laughs> afternoon <laughs> the thing though is, it, um, is like every day my the saving grace is to be gentle and and the meta to teach to kind of like Love who I am enough to keep with it. Okay. One day this last week, I thought, "Oh, this is so great. This is this is what it means to love myself. I to to meditate twice a day, and and that day I meditated twice a day. And do you think I could sit down the next day? <laughs> it, and I think, what's with that? You know, <laughs> how can you how can you know something one day and then the next day just totally ignore it? And so I, um, what I did do that evening was I just, I don't care, Diane, what you do, but you're sitting whether you want to or not. It was just like I took myself by the scruff and plopped me down, and I kind of sat there and meditated, you know, with an attitude of like, you know, I don't want to do this. But I did it, and I was, I thought, oh, good girl. This, this is not too bad. And it's it just like, I th the more I learn about who I am or my mind, it's, it's just so revealing and sometimes scary as heck. I don't want to be there. I don't like it at all. And I think, oh, you know, and then I, I dig around and try to find who was it who put that thought in my head? You know, I want to blame somebody. And then I thought, you know, you know, you accept what you do into your mind and kind of, anyway, this is just wonderful. And I'm so glad I'm here. And again, thank you for teaching. You're welcome. I'm so glad you're here too for what you, what you just said. The, uh, the best way to overcome that conditioned response that I don't want to sit is to sit. And every time you sit when you don't want to sit, you're, you're deconditioning that conditioned response. And it really works in that that direct way. That's just the way it is. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Bonnie, good to see you. We missed you last week. I miss being here. Yeah, um, stuff from Stockman up, being away and the breaking of the habit. And we, my husband and I would talk to him, oh, we'll, we'll sit. Well, there are friends will sit with us, you know. <laughs> and not so much. And, <laughs> and what I tried to do was anytime I had like, uh, I'll wait in the car or whatever, wherever I 
could, even if it was for a minute, and I'm like, oh, of course, you better breathe now. <laughs> you know, just take time in between some, I don't know if it added up to 20 minutes by the end of the day, but maybe. Um, we did get, I did, we went on this, um, to a very beautiful uh, park, it was a, a Japanese bonsai place, so there were so many places to sit and meditate. We could meditate here, and people just kept talking and walking, I was like, I don't know, I just wanted it. So there were so many benches and places along the way, but, um, so it was really good to come home and uh, start sitting again every morning together. So that was really wonderful. And I'm uh, trying to get a new um, uh, observing sort of viewpoint of, of my breath and breath in my body and the separation from the thoughts as they come and go, which is I won't go into all of the wacky ways that I've been trying to figure it out, but um, it's been really useful. And um, seeing also the thoughts of being separate, in a way, from each other and from me. Yeah. Even though they keep walking through the room. Um, so, so, so it's, it's been really good to increase the sit time. And of course, it's all of the effort, the mindfulness, the meditation, every single one of them, for me, it's just like a circle, like the clock, and they just one move to the other. You can't do one without the other. And, um, so that's really useful and really helpful. That we had a, just really quickly, no, we were trapped on a plane for eight and a half hours. Ooh. and. And I thought we did really well. Yeah. We didn't kill anyone. We made funny <laughs> videos. I was, you know, but it was, um, yeah. We both talked about how because it, it was not a very good experience, but we were just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but and, yeah, I think the meditation. I'd like to think how to handle it and the whole mindfulness and the. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. You remind me, I used to go to Hawaii often, and the trip out there, uh, back then it was 18 to 21 hours, uh, maybe a little quicker coming back because of the jet stream or something. I never could quite figure that out, but I never minded going out there, however, however long it took. In fact, I get as soon as I cross into the Pacific Ocean, I go in the, in the bathroom, I put my shorts and my flip-flops on, <laughs> getting ready. I was well, a much was younger person. This was supposed to be a three-and-a-half-hour flight, so oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, the, the flight back is always tough, especially in the winter. Um, thank, thank, um, thankfully, I understand impermanence now. That works. What's remarkable about what you said is that even on vacation, you remembered to even to go to the car and take a few moments, you know, and to and to really. Diane talked about this too. What a loving thing it is to just take care of ourselves, to use this practice. I mean, that's what it's for. It's about developing great self-compassion, great gentleness towards ourselves, and to know what to do in a situation when we're stressed out. We don't have to continue it. We, there, we have some tools that we've developed to, to address common human problems, and it works beautifully. Thank you for saying that. It sounds like you might have meditated like 10 times in one day. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Right? Well, maybe. <laughs> Not all at once. Well, right. But... You still used it. You know, good for you. Liz, good to see you tonight. How are you? Good to see you. Good to be here. I remember, um, might have even been the first time that I came here, that um, I always thought that if I didn't have a problem I was working on in my mind, that I wasn't being proactive about my life in some way. Yep. And um, it's been uh, one of the biggest reliefs has been to understand that um, you truly have a choice of what you think about yep. and how that has affected me um, really profoundly because um, if you are caught up in your own thoughts and they're agitating you, then obviously it's going to affect your next interaction with the next person that comes in the room. Yeah. 
So anyway, that's been a really um, important lesson, and it is through effort, the right effort, the effort to bring your self back to the breath, your effort to sit, your effort to understand that you have control over what you think about, um, and that just sort of chewing on something in your head doesn't necessarily mean you're solving a problem. Yeah. Um, so, and this is round two for me, I said this last week, but this is round two for me on the lessons directly from the book, and um, you know, I really feel like it's starting to sink in. Yeah, yeah it, it does take some repetition though, doesn't it? It, it? it does take some repetition. It's not like a uh, it's not like a course that we can just study and memorize it and we have it. We have to integrate it and experience it and apply it in our day to day life. And I think the fact that you kind of slow your thoughts down um, and start to begin to understand it, that it opens yourself up to receiving the information more clearly. Yes. Uh, again, going back to right meditation, deepening concentration. That's that's why it's there, so that our mind is quiet enough to see what's going on. Well, thank you, John. Uh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. The um, that <clears throat> that overarching view of mindfulness or skill of mindfulness that we develop is so much different than what we're taught what isn't the right word i can't think i'm not i'm having trouble putting the right words to things but i'll use it what, how we're taught to think which is almost like like that always life is about solving an ongoing list of problems here's one we, we got that one what's the next one and when we start looking at that what we're really describing is the problem of me and the way that i live in the world and okay, I've, I've found this one out, I fixed it, but here's another one. And we spend our whole lives chasing that, when in fact, it's it's because we have lost control of our thinking. And somebody might ask, well, where, when did that happen? It doesn't matter when it happened. We've done it. Mm -hmm. And the, the, Buddha, the Buddha realized that 2,600 years ago. And so he taught a way to, to reclaim our own thinking. The Vitaka Santana Sutta is so beautiful in that it, it teaches exactly that. It teaches why we do this. And the, the Buddha concludes that sutta with saying we gain the ability to think what we want to think when we want to think it. Mm -hmm. That's the essence of a well-concentrated mind that's at peace. We, no matter what occurs, we can think what we want. In other words, another way of saying that is we always have an appropriate response or a, a response that's rested in the refined mindfulness of the Dhamma, no matter what's occurring. We stay at peace. Another way of saying that, two words are very simple, is that's right view. We see things in reality the way they really are. So thank you. Lorna, good to see you tonight. How's your practice? Uh, good, thank you. Good to be here. Thank you, John. Um, reading the chapters, um, I was reminded that distractions are always outside your body. I don't hold that in mind as much as I should do. Um, so that was a good thing that I just sort of came across from the readings that reminded me. Um, something else I uh, And now we're sort of coming to the eight, four, end of the eight four path. Um, if if I'm just reading what we've done, the work we've done over the last few weeks has emphasised that it's actually your own meditation that makes your practice individual to yourself. Meaning that you, we often come to class and you read suttas and teach them the Buddha one thing or another, which is kind of like a, a broad brush stroke and it catches everybody. But to really recognize your own craving and clinging and aversion, which is your own practice. We all have different experiences and we've all got different issues with craving and clinging and and the version and to get to know your own practice and make your own practice individual you have it's through meditation that you do that and that's what makes your practice a little bit different from everybody else's in the saga yeah um, so that that sort of came through to, 
came through this time around the reading and the second to the end of the eight path that's not so good. And also that it's through meditation. I, and I look at meditation as you, you put yourself in an ideal situation to quieten your mind. You often move away from the family or away from the dogs or whatever distractions you have. Um, close the door, sit quietly, um, and give yourself perfect concentration time. And it's through those moments when your mind does quieten that it gives you, um, that's like the tip of the arrow or the tip of the spear, that that's as good as you can get at that moment, where you, where you are in that moment. And that's as then that's really where we're heading off the cushion. But we haven't got, we haven't got there yet. Um, but if you can really quiet your mind and observe when you're just focusing on your breath and there's no other thoughts coming in, going out, your mind's not dancing around like it usually is. And those moments that that happens in meditation is where we're heading for in our practice. So you kind of, it kind of gives you something to believe in throughout the day and when we try to correct ourselves in craving, clean and aversion, etc. And uh, quite in our mind, that those moments on, in meditation is, is how we believe in getting there, how we find our way to get there. Otherwise, it's you can't describe meditation to somebody who hasn't done it hasn't been there because yeah. it, there's nothing to relate it to. Um, so, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're, you're right, you can't describe it. Um, you can only explain how you do it, which is really all, the only thing. The Buddha gave very little instruction on meditation itself because it doesn't require a lot of meditation. One of the things that he always consistently pointed out is the need to develop a quiet and peaceful environment. Go find the root of a tree or an empty hut. And that's what it, that means. Go find a place of solitude to, for your practice. Um, and beyond that, you're, it is a very individual experience with the common framework for all of us to practice it of the Eightfold Path. So everybody's experience is going to be different. We, have, we all have different um, aspects of conditioned thinking that we need to address and overcome. Uh, some people will take to the practice almost immediately, and some people really have to work on it. And a good example I always come back to is Kandana, who heard the Buddha's teachings once and awakened. All conditioned things that arise are subject to cessation. Okay, you got it, Kandana. And then the Buddha's cousin, who heard every talk he ever gave, didn't awaken, gain full human maturity until a month after the Buddha passed. And he did it because he was pissed off. <laughs> he was going to be left out of the first Buddhist council because he didn't awaken yet. But he got it. But it took him a while. You know, uh, that there was something else you said that I want to comment on. Maybe next week. But you thank you. Yeah. Mindfulness here. <laughs> yeah. So much for concentration. <laughs> uh, a, a great discussion. So um, this week we'll study. Uh, the Three Marks of Existence, uh, week seven in the book, Anicca, Anatta, and Dukkha. And I know I talked about splitting it up, but it really is not appropriate to, because it's a long chapter to read, but you know, take an extra half hour, you'll get through it. The um, It really needs to be read and taught in context. There's no sense in separating it. You just you lose the context because they are called the three linked or the three marks of existence, of human existence. Everybody who was born into this world is subject to these marks. Now, the reason why they use the word marks is everybody carries the mark of impermanence. Everybody carries the mark of not self. Everybody carries the mark, unfortunately, of dukkha and ongoing unsatisfactory or disappointing experience in life. Uh, and it's, it's because of what the Buddha awakened to. It's because of ignorance that we're subject to the stress of the environment that we live in and the misunderstanding of self, if we if we weren't ignorant, we don't we would understand who we are in relation to this phenomenal world, and we wouldn't create additional stress over it. Does that make sense? That last statement to, to you, all of you. It's through a lack of understanding of the impermanent nature of all things, 
a lack of understanding of what truly constitutes a self that gives rise to all manner of dukkha. They're all linked together. Now, if we can develop an understanding of who we truly are and develop a true understanding of the impermanent nature of all things, then we will no longer contribute to dukkha. They will no longer be linked. They'll no longer be clinging to each other. It's really the fundamental understanding of the entire Dhamma is to understand the interplay of anicca, anatta, and dukkha, impermanence, not self, and the resulting suffering. So one of the things that becomes difficult in understanding impermanence, it, it, it's, uh, I often get an email from a, an online student. It doesn't happen here because we're usually talking about it, but an online student, when they first start reading my book and they come across uh, the initial importance that I place on understanding impermanence, I'll invariably get an email back saying, well, I, I don't know why you're making such a point of this. I, you know, I, re I understand impermanence. And then when they get to chapter seven, they realize, wow, I didn't really understand it. Because we don't. We, we, ac we accept the fact that things are impermanent. But what we don't accept is that our views of ourselves that we hope we can fix in place are also impermanent. We want to hold on to these views. And because we can take a view and, and hold that same view for years and years and years and perhaps through our entire lifetime, we don't understand that it's, it's because of constantly reinforcing that view that we're able to maintain that view. Does that make sense? So I don't know why I want, I don't want to use a political metaphor, so I won't. A view might be, and it's a view that I held because of the environment that I brought up in is that the Yankees were the best team in the world. And I always wanted to play center field for the Yankees. I didn't want to look at the fact that I was probably six inches too short and about three feet too slow to ever play center field for the Yankees. <laughs> I kept maintaining the belief that someday, some by some mirror, I didn't even play that much baseball, but somehow Joe Torrey's gonna give me a call and say, hey, we need you, can you get here tonight? It never happened. But I wanted to hold on to that ridiculous belief. I'm using a silly example. And it took an, a subconscious but ongoing effort to keep coming back to that belief. And I really, honestly, I didn't let go of that belief until I was, 59, two years ago. <laughs> it took me a while to, to finally come to grips that I'm not going to play center field for the Yankees because it was such an ingrained thought in me. It was a ridiculous thought. And also, when I was into baseball, I would, I would, I would look at – I wouldn't get interested in other teams because they weren't my team. So that view that the Yankees were the only really good team prevented me from enjoying the Cardinals or the Senators or the Mets. You know? Oh, it is true. Uh, I know it's true, but <laughs> so there was there was continuity in my belief that belied the impermanence underneath it all. Because every moment that I had a thought of I'm going to play center field for the Yankees, I could realize, well, that's ridiculous, and let it go, and let impermanence take its place, and develop a calm and peaceful mind over it. Another way of looking at continuity: continuity often obscures impermanence, and we often look to continuity. To not say to ourselves, look at this, there's no such thing as impermanence, but we don't we don't recognize the underlying impermanence that is hidden by continuity. So a good example of that is our own physical being. We know that every moment that we're alive, millions of cells come into existence and millions of cells die from existence. The Buddha pointed this out 2,600 years ago, by the way, he used the word kalabas to point out an even more fundamental aspect of that, something that physicists are just coming to understand today. Uh, he, dis he described the underlying formative energy of the universe as kalapas, and he described those as infinitesimally, infinitesimal, I can't say the word, small particles that millions and millions and millions of them blink into existence and blink out of existence every moment. Isn't that remarkable? There was no, no way to measure anything 2,600 years ago. The Buddha developed this from that deeply well-concentrated mind and observing what's occurring. And somehow he figured out what, again, what physicists are just coming to grips with 2,600 years ago. But that, that also applies to who we are. Who we are is part of that kalapas. It's part of that ongoing process of things coming into existence and blinking out of existence constantly continually that is an exercise in impermanence 
And it points to the potential that with the right thinking, with gaining control of the way that we think, with holding in mind what we want to think when we want to think it, we can affect what we become. Because each moment that we're thinking, we're also affecting these kalapas. Now, getting back to who we are as a physical being, all of us, unless you're really something special, have had the same body since you were born. But because of the continuity of your body, you don't notice the impermanence that's taken place. You don't, un, you don't see it, and we don't need to see it, how all of those cells that have come into existence and blinked out of existence in the course of our lives. It's said that over the course of seven years, every cell is replaced in our body. We don't notice it, but if it wasn't occurring, we wouldn't be here. Another way of looking at this is, this is not the same body I had when I was born. It's certainly not the same body I had when I was 5, 10, 15, or 20. It's certainly not the same body I had when I walked up here tonight, is it? But the continuity of this body doesn't mean that impermanence isn't always taking place. And the same is true, and this is even more important than recognizing the impermanence and ever-changing nature of our, of our physical body. What's most important, and it's what Kandana got when he first heard the Buddha teach, was that it's our self-referential views that are as impermanent as the Kalapas. And in order for us to maintain those views, it takes a tremendous amount of wrong effort. In fact, you could probably say that most of the effort that we expend is maintaining self-referential views. Many people, when they fart, fart excuse me, <laughs> many people, when they fart, have an, an <laughs> impermanent experience that thankfully doesn't last too long. <laughs> no, I really lost my train of thought. Many people, when they start <laughs> developing, start developing the Dhamma. And, and as their meditation practice starts taking hold, feel just more energetic. And they physically are because you're not spending as much mental energy on useless things as you used to. You're gaining control of your thinking. The same is true that of the effect that our well-focused mind has on our physical well-being. We're not creating stress in our lives anymore. John Kabat-Zinn proved that beautifully when he developed mindfulness-based stress reduction. But the same is true of the stress reduction that we developed through a simple Dhamma practice. To recognize the impermanence of all of our self-referential views. And again, we don't need it in an analytical way. We don't have to look at every one of our views. Just accept the impermanence of our own self-referential views. And the foolishness of trying to maintain that which is inherently impermanent will gain the ability to simply let those views, excuse me, let those views go. Bringing it back to the three marks of existence. That's why it's so important to understand these three marks of existence. These three aspects that we all carry the mark of. We all are living in an impermanent environment. And the environment of me is just as impermanent as the outer environment. I was born in this life with a misunderstanding, with an ignorance of four noble truths. And that has resulted in a view that is anatta not a self. The views that I holding, I'm holding of myself, if they're rooted in ignorance, do not constitute a real self. What's the importance of that understanding? Again, it's not to figure out every wrong view. It's to simply recognize that the views I have are rooted in ignorance. Let them go. And as I can develop an understanding of the impermanent nature of all things, including and most importantly, my own self-referential thoughts, I'll diminish that third mark of existence my contributions to stress, my contributions to, to dukkha, my contributions to, my, to the disappointments I have in my life. And then we start unbinding these three lit characteristics. And so what is that like? Well, then we're able to live in a world that we understand fully is impermanent as Kandana did. But from a view rooted in right view rather than wrong view. And the resulting contribution to stress and suffering does not no longer occurs. We're able to maintain a peaceful mind and a peaceful body while in the constant state of change, or another way of saying that is a constant state of becoming. We can't do anything about it. When the Buddha first taught what dukkha is, 
he described the entire life of impermanence. Birth is suffering, sickness is suffering, aging is suffering, death is suffering. That's all we got, folks. But in between that span of time, impermanence allows us to awaken at any moment if we have the right tools. And if it wasn't for understanding the three marks of existence, there'd be no awakening possible, would it? We would just be stuck in this ongoing, it's almost like a Groundhog Day experience. We just keep recreating the conditions for further suffering. But because we can gain control of our thinking, because we have a framework for doing this, we can step off at any time. Or another way of saying it is we can enter the stream of awakening at any time. And as long as we maintain the framework of the Eightfold Path, we're maintaining the ride in the stream. We're always going in the right direction. Of course, we can step off, step out of the river, step out of the stream at any point that we choose. But like a few of you described being on vacation, all it takes to get back into the stream is to sit and meditate, develop an understanding of the Eightfold Path. So that's enough of a talk on this. Is there any questions about what I just said uh, prior to your uh, reading this this week. No? Wow. Okay. So enjoy your study. Uh, we'll talk about it next week. And I'll introduce uh, dependent origination next week. <coughs> Excuse me. And we will split week up into two weeks. We'll, we'll do dependent origination the first week and then the five clinging aggregates uh, the second week. That really is too much to do in one, one week. And the, the context won't be lost there. So. Uh, no questions, no comments before we finish with Metta? All right, let's finish with the Buddha's words on Metta. Uh, so find your relaxed meditative posture and gently close your eyes and gently close your mouth. And so these are the Buddha's words on Metta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is no longer born into this world. Thank you for a wonderful class. Peace.